the most pleasant and delectable tale of the marriage of Cupid and Psyches. There was sometimes a certain king, inhabiting in the west parts, who had to wife a noble dame, by whom he had three daughters exceeding fair, of whom the two elder were of such comely shape and beauty, as they did excel and pass all other women living, whereby they were thought worthily to deserve the praise and commendation of every person, and deservedly to be preferred above the residue of the common sort. Yet the singular passing beauty and maidenly majesty of the youngest daughter did so far a surmount and excel them too, as no earthly creature could by any means sufficiently express or set out the same. By reason whereof, after the fame of this excellent maiden was spread about in every part of the city, the citizens and strangers there being inwardly pricked by the zealous affection to behold her famous person, came daily by thousands, hundreds, and scores, to her father's palace, who was astonished with admiration of her incomparable beauty, did no less worship and reverence her with crosses, signas, and tokens, and other divine adorations, according to the custom of the old used rites and ceremonies, than if she were the Lady Venus indeed, and shortly after the fame was spread into the next cities and bordering regions, that the goddess whom the deep seas had borne and brought forth, and the froth of the waves had nourished, to the intent to show her high magnificency and divine power on earth, to such as erst did honor and worship her, was now conversant among mortal men, or else that the earth and not the sea, by a new concourse and influence of the celestial planets, had budded and yielded forth a new Venus, endued with the flower of virginity. So daily more and more increased this opinion, and now as her flying fame dispersed into the next island, and well nigh unto every part and province of the whole world. Whereupon innumerable strangers resorted from far countries, adventuring themselves by long journeys on land and by great perils on water, to behold this glorious virgin. By occasion whereof such a contempt grew towards the goddess Venus, that no person travelled unto the town Paphos, nor to the isle Gindos, nor to Sathira to worship her. Her ornaments were thrown out, her temples defaced, her pillows and cushions torna, her ceremonies neglected, her images and statues uncrowned, and her bare altars unswept, and foul with the ashes of old burnt sacrifice. For why, every person honoured and worshipped this maiden instead of Venus, and in the morning at her first coming abroad offered unto her oblations, provided banquets, called her by the name of Venus, which was not Venus indeed, and in her honour presented flowers and garlands in most reverend fashion. This sudden change and alteration of celestial honour did greatly inflame and kindle the love of very Venus, who unable to temper herself from indignation, shaking her head in raging sort, reasoned with herself in this manner. Behold the original parent of all these elements, behold the Lady Venus renowned throughout all the world, with whom a mortal maiden is joined now partaker of honor. My name registered in the city of heaven is profaned and made vile by terrene absurdities. If I shall suffer any mortal creature to present my majesty on earth, or that any shall bear about a false surmised shape of her person, then in vain did Paris the sheepherd, in whose judgment and competence the great Jupiter had affiance, prefere me above the residue of the goddesses, for the excellency of my beauty, but she, whatever she be that hath usurped mine honour, shall shortly repent her of her unlawful estate. And by and by she called her winged son Cupid, rash enough and hardy, who by his evil manners contemning all public justice and law, armed with fire and arrows, running up and down in the nights from house to house, and corrupting the lawful marriages of every person, doth nothing but that which is evil, who although that he were of his own proper nature sufficiently prone to work mischief, Yet she egged him forward with words and brought him to the city, and shewed him Psyche's, for. So the maid was called, and having told the cause of her anger, not without great rage, I pray thee, quoth she, my dear child, by motherly bond of love, by the sweet wounds of thy piercing darts, by the pleasant heat of thy fire, revenge the injury which is done to thy mother by the false and disobedient beauty of a mortal maiden, and I pray thee, that without delay she may fall in love with the most miserablest creature living, the most poor, the most crooked, and the most vile, that there may be none found in all the world of like wretchedness. When she had spoken these words she embraced and kissed her son, and took her voyage toward the sea. When she came upon the sea she began to call the gods and goddesses, who were obedient at her voice. For incontinent came the daughters of Nereus, singing with tunes melodiously, Portunus with his bristled and rough beard, Salita with her bosom full of fish, Palamon the driver of the dolphin, the trumpeters of Triton, leaping hither and thither, 
and blowing with heavenly noise, such was the company which followed Venus, marching towards the ocean sea. In the mean season Psyches with all her beauty received no fruit of honor. She was wondered at of all, she was praised of all, but she perceived that no king nor prince, nor any one of the superior sort did repair to war her. Every one marveled at her divine beauty, as it were some image well painted and set out. Her other two sisters, which were nothing so greatly exalted by the people, were royally married to two kings, but the virgin Psyches, sitting alone at home, lamented her solitary life, and being disquieted both in mind and body, although she pleased all the world, yet hated she in herself her own beauty. Whereupon the miserable father of this unfortunate daughter, suspecting that the gods and powers of heaven did envy her estate, went to the town called Millet to receive the oracle of Apollo, where he made his prayers and offered sacrifice, and desired a husband for his daughter, but Apollo though he were a Grecian, and of the country of Ionia, because of the foundation of Millet, yet he gave answer in Latine verse, the sense whereof was this. Let Psyche's core be clad in mourning weed, and set on rock of yonder hill aloft, her husband is no white of humane seed, but serpent dire and fierce as might be thought. Who flies with wings above and starry skies, and doth subdue each thing with fiery flight? The gods themselves, and powers that seem so wise, with mighty Jove, be subject to his might, the rivers black, and deadly flouds of pain and darkness eek, as thrall to him remain. The king, sometimes happy when he heard the prophecy of Apollo, returned home sad and sorrowful, and declared to his wife the miserable and unhappy fate of his daughter. Then they began to lament and weep, and passed over many days in great sorrow. But now the time approached of Psyche's marriage, preparation was made, black torches were lighted, the pleasant songs were turned into pitiful cries, the melody of Hymenaeus was ended with deadly howling, the maid that should be married did wipe her eyes with her veil. All the family and people of the city weep likewise, and with great lamentation was ordained a remiss time for that day, but necessity compelled that Psyche should be brought to her appointed place, according to the divine appointment. And when the solemnity was ended, they went to bring the sorrowful spouse, not to her marriage, but to her final end in burial. And while the father and mother of Psyches did go forward weeping and crying unto this enterprise, Psyches spake unto them in this sort, why torment your unhappy age with continual dolor? Why trouble you your spirits, which are more rather mine than yours? Why soil ye your faces with tears, which I ought to adore and worship? Why tear you my eyes in yours? Why pull you your hoary hairs? Why knock ye your breasts for me? Now you see the reward of my excellent beauty, now, now you perceive, but too late, the plague of envy. When the people did honor me, and call me new Venus, then ye should have wept, then ye should have sorrowed as though I had been dead, for now I see and perceive that I am come to this misery by the only name of Venus, bring me, and as fortune has appointed, place me on the top of the rock, I greatly desire to end my marriage, I greatly covet to see my husband. Why do I delay? Why should I refuse him that is appointed to destroy all the world? Thus ended she her words, and thrust herself among the people that followed. Then they brought her to the appointed rock of the high hill, and set, her, Hiran, and so departed. The torches and lights were put out with the tears of the people, and every man gone home, the miserable parents well nigh consumed with sorrow, gave themselves to everlasting darkness. Thus poor Psyche's being left alone, weeping and trembling on the top of the rock, was blown by the gentle air and of shrilling Zephyrus, and carried from the hill with a meek wind, which retained her garments up, and by little and little bought her down into a deep valley, where she was laid in a bed of most sweet and fragrant flowers. Thus fair Psyche's being sweetly couched among the soft and tender herbs, as in a bed of sweet and fragrant flowers, and having qualified the thoughts and troubles of her restless mind, was now well reposed. And when she had refreshed herself sufficiently with sleep, she rose with a more quiet and pacified mind, and fortune to us be a pleasant wood environed with great and mighty trees. She espied likewise a running river as clear as crystal, in the midst of the wood well nigh at the fall of the river was a princely edifice, wrought and builded not by the art or hand of man, but by the mighty power of God, and you would judge at the first entry therein, that it were some pleasant and worthy mansion for the powers of heaven. For the embowings above were of citron and ivory, 
propped and undermined with pillars of gold, the walls covered and sealed with silver, divers sorts of beasts were graven and carved, that seemed to encounter with such as entered in. All things were so curiously and finely wrought, that it seemed either to be the work of some demi-god, or of God himself. The pavement was all of precious stones, divided and cut one from another, whereon was carved diverse kinds of pictures, in such sort that blessed and thrice-blessed were they that might go upon such a pavement, every part and angle of the house was so well adorned, that by reason of the precious stones and inestimable treasure there, it glittered and shone in such sort, that the chambers, porches, and doors gave light as it had been the sun. Neither otherwise did the other treasure of the house disagree unto so great a majesty, that verily it seemed in every point an heavenly palace, fabricate and built for Jupiter himself. Then Psyche's moved with delectation approached nigh and taking a bold heart entrade into the house, and beheld everything there with great affection, she saw storehouses wrought exceedingly fine, and replenished with abundance of riches. Finally, there could nothing be devised which lacked there, but among such great store of treasure this was most marvellous, that there was no closure, bolt, nor lot to keep the same. And when with great pleasure she had viewed all these things, she heard a voice without any body, that said, Why do you marvel madam at so great riches? Behold, all that you see is at your commandment, wherefore go you into the chamber, and repose yourself upon the bed, and desire what bath you will have, and we whose voices you hear be your servants, and ready to minister unto you according to your desire. In the mean season, royal meats and dainty dishes shall be prepared for you. Then Psyches perceived the felicity of divine providence, and according to the advertisement of the incorporeal voices she first reposed herself upon the bed, and then refreshed her body in the banes. This done, she saw the table garnished with meats, and a chair to sit down. When Psyches was set down, all sorts of divine meats and wines were brought in, not by any body, but as it were with a wind, for she saw no person before her, but only heard voices on every side. After that all the services were brought to the table, one came in and sung invisibly, another played on the harp, but she saw no man. The harmony of the instruments did so greatly shrill in her ears, that though there were no manner of person, yet seemed she in the midst of a multitude of people. All these pleasures finished, when night approached Psyche's went to bed, and when she was laid, that the sweet sleep came upon her, she greatly feared her virginity, because she was alone. Then came her unknown husband and lay with her, and after that he had made a perfect consummation of the marriage, he rose in the morning before day, and departed. Sun after came her invisible servants, and presented to her such things as were necessary for her defloration. And thus she passed forth a great while, and as it happeneth, the novelty of the things by continual custom did increase her pleasure, but especially the sound of the instruments was a comfort to her being alone. During this time that Psyches was in this place of pleasures, her father and mother did nothing but weep and lament, and her two sisters hearing of her most miserable fortune, came with great dolor and sorrow to comfort and speak with her parents. The night following, Psyche's husband spake unto her, for she might feel his eyes, his hands, and his ears, and said, O my sweet spouse and dear wife, fortune doth menace unto the imminent danger, whereof I wish thee greatly to beware, for know that thy sisters, thinking that thou art dead, be greatly troubled, and are coming to the mountain by thy steps. Whose lamentations if thou fortune to hear, beware that thou do in no wise make answer or look up towards them, for if thou do thou shalt purchase to me great sorrow, and to thyself utter destruction. Psyche's hearing her husband, was contented to do all things as he had commanded. After that he was departed and the night passed away, Psyche's lamented and lamented all the day following, thinking that now she was past all hopes of comfort, in that she was closed within the walls of a prison, deprived of humane conversation, and commanded not to aid her sorrowful sisters, no nor once to see them. Thus she passed all the day in weeping, and went to bed at night, without any refection of meat or bane. Incontinently after came her husband, who when he had embraced her sweetly, began to say, Is it thus that I find you perform your promise, my sweet wife? What do I find here? Passe you all the day and the night in weeping? And will you not cease in your husband's arms? Go to, do what you will, purchase your own destruction, and when you find it so, then remember my words, and repent but too late. 
Then she desired her husband more and more, assuring him that she should die, unless he would grant that she might see her sisters, whereby she might speak with them and comfort them, whereat at length he was contented, and moreover he willed that she should give them as much gold and jewels as she would. But he gave her a further charge saying, Beware that ye covet not, being moved by the pernicious counsel of you sisters, to see the shape of my person, lest by your curiosity you deprive yourself of so great and worthy estate. Psyche's being glad herewith, rendered unto him most entire thanks, and said, Sweet husband, I had rather die than to be separated from you, for whosoever you be, I love and retain you within my heart, as if you were mine own spirit or Cupid himself, but I pray you grant this likewise, that you would command your servant Zephyrus to bring my sisters down into the valley as he brought me. Wherewithal she kissed him sweetly, and desired him gently to grant her request, calling him her spouse, her sweetheart, her joy, and her solace. Worby she enforced him to agree to her mind, and when morning came he departed away. After long search made, the sisters of Psyches came unto the hill where she was set on the rock, and cried with a loud voice in such sort that the stones answered again. And when they called their sister by her name, that their lamentable cries came unto her ears, she came forth and said, Behold, here is she for whom you weep, I pray you torment yourselves no more, cease your weeping. And by and by she commanded Zephyrus by the appointment of her husband to bring them down. Neither did he delay, for with gentle blasts he retained them up and laid them softly in the valley. I am not able to express the often embracing, kissing, and greeting which was between them three, all sorrows and tears were then laid apart. Come in, quoth Psyches, into our house, and refresh your afflicted Mindies with your sister. After this she shewed them the storehouses of treasure, she caused them to hear the voices which served her, the bane was ready, the meats were brought in, and when they had filled themselves with divine delicates, they conceived great envy within their hearts, and one of them being curious, did demand what her husband was, of what estate, and who was lord of so precious a house. But Psyche's remembering the promise which she had made to her husband, feigned that he was a young man, of comely stature, with a flaxen beard, and had great delight in hunting the dales and hills by. And lest by her long talk as she should be found to trip or fail in her words, she filled their laps with gold, silver, and jewels, and commanded Zephyrus to carry them away. When they were brought up to the mountain, they made their ways homeward to their own houses, and murmured with envy that they bear against Psyches, saying, Behold cruel and contrary fortune, behold how we, born all of one parent, have diverse destinies, but especially we that are the elder to be married to strange husbands, made as handmaidens, and as it were banished from our count ray and friends. Whereas our younger sister hath great abundance of treasure, and hath gotten a god to her husband, although she hath no skill how to use such great plenty of riches. Saw you not, sister, what was in the house, what great store of jewels, what glittering robes, what gems, what gold we trod on? That if she hath a husband according as she affirmeth, there is none that liveth this day more happy in all the world than she. And so it may come to pass a, at length for the great affection which he may bear unto her that he may make her a goddess, for by Hercules, such was her countenance, so she behaved herself, that as a goddess she had voices to serve her, and the winds did obey her. But I poor wretch have first married an husband elder than my father, more bald than a coot, more weak than a child, and that locketh me up all day in the house. Then said the other sister, And in faith I am married to a husband that hath the gout, twyfold, crooked, nor courageous in paying my debt, I am fain to rub and mollify his stony fingers with diverse sorts of oils, and to wrap them in plasters and salves, so that I soil my white and dainty hands with the corruption of filthy clouts, not using myself like a wife, but more like a servant. And you my sisters seem likewise to be in bondage and servitude, wherefore I cannot abide to see our younger sister in such felicity, saw you not I pray you how proudly and arrogantly she handled us even now? And how in vaunting herself she uttered her presumptuous mind, how she cast a little gold into our laps, and being weary of our company, commanded that we should be born and blown away? Verily I live not, nor am a woman, but I will deprive her of all her bliss. And if you my sister be so far bent as I, let us consult together, and not to utter our men to any person, no not to our parents, nor tell that ever we saw her. For it sufficeth that we have seen her, whom it repenteth to have seen. 
neither let us declare her good fortune to our father, nor to any other, since as they see me not happy whose riches are unknown, so shall she know that she hath sisters no abjects, but worthier than she. But now let us go home to our husbands in poor houses, and when we are better instructed, let us return to suppress her pride. So this evil counsel pleased these two evil women, and they hid the treasure which Psyches gave them, and tear their hair, renewing their false and forged tears. When their father and mother beheld them weep and lament still, they doubled their sorrows and griefs, but full of yire and forced with envy, they took their voyage homeward, devising the slaughter and destruction of their sister. In the mean season the husband of Psyches did warn her again in the night with these words, Sayest thou not, quoth he, What peril and danger evil fortune doth threaten unto thee, whereof if thou take not good heed it will shortly come upon thee? For the unfaithful harlots do greatly endeavour to set their snares to catch thee, and their purpose is to make and persuade thee to behold my face, which if thou once fortune to see, as I have often told, thou shalt see no more. Wherefore if these naughty hags, armed with wicked minds, do chance to again, as I think no otherwise but that they will, take heed that thou talk not with them but simply suffer them to speak what they will, howbeit if thou canst not refrain thyself, beware that thou have no communication of thy husband, nor answer a word if they fortune to question of me, so will we increase our stock, and this young and tender child, couched in this young and tender belly of thine, shall be made an immortal god, otherwise a mortal creature. Then Psyches was very glad that she should bring forth a divine babe, and very joyful in that she should be honored as a mother. She reckoned and numbered carefully the days and months that passed, and being never with child before, did marvel greatly that in so short a time her belly should swell so big. But those pestilent and wicked furies breathing out their serpentine poison, took shipping to bring their enterprise to passe. Then Psyches was warned again by her husband in this sort, Behold the last day, the extreme case, and the enemies of thy blood, hath armed themselves against us, pitched their camp, set their host in array, and are marching towards us, for now thy two sisters have drawn their swords and are ready to slay thee. Oh, with what force are we assailed on this day? O oh, sweet Psyches, I pray thee to take pity on thyself, of me, and deliver thy husband and this infant within thy belly from so great danger, and see not, neither hear these cursed women, which are not worthy to be called thy sisters, for their great hatred and breach of sisterly amity, for they will come like sirens to the mountains, and yield out their piteous and lamentable cries. When Psyches had heard these words she sighed sorrowfully and said, O oh, dear husband this long time have you had experience and trial of my faith, and doubt you not that I will persevere in the same, wherefore command your wind Zephyrus, that he may do as he hath done before, to the intent that where you have charged me not to behold your venerable face, yet that I may comfort myself with the sight of my sisters. I pray you by these beautiful hairs, by these round cheeks delicate and tender, by your pleasant hot breast, whose shape and face I shall learn at length by the child in my belly, grant the fruit of my desire, refresh your dear spouse Psyches with joy, who is bound and linked unto you forever. I little esteem to see your visage and figure, little though I regard the night and darkness thereof, for you are my only light. Her husband being as it were enchanted with these words and compelled by violence of her often embracing, wiping away her tears with his hair, did yield unto his wife. And when morning came, departed as he was accustomed to do. Now her sisters arrived on land, and never rested till they came to the rock, without visiting their parents, and leapt down rashly from the hill themselves. Then Zephyrus according to the divine commandment brought them down, although it were against his will, and laid them in the valley without any harm, by and by they went into the palace to their sister without leave, and when they had Ephson embraced their prey, and thanked her with flattering words for the treasure which she gave them, they said, O oh dear sister Psyches, know you that you are now no more a child, but a mother, oh what great joy bear you unto us in your belly! What a comfort will it be unto all the house! How happy shall we be, that shall see this infant nourished amongst so great plenty of treasure! that if he be like his parents, as it is necessary he should, there is no doubt but a new Cupid shall be born. By this kind of measures they went about to win Psyches by little and little, but because they were weary with travel, they sate them down in chairs, and after that they had washed their bodies in veins they went into a parlour, where all kind of meats were ready prepared. Psyches commanded one to play with his harp, it was done. Then immediately others sung, others tuned their instruments, but no person was seen, 
by whose sweet harmony and modulation the sisters of Psyches were greatly delighted. Howbeit the wickedness of these cursed women was nothing suppressed by the sweet noise of these instruments, but they settled themselves to work their treasons against Psyches, demanding who was her husband, and of what parentage. Then she having forgotten by too much simplicity, what she had spoken before of her husband, invented a new answer, and said that her husband was of a great province, a merchant, and a man of middle age, having his beard interspersed with grey hairs. Which when she had spoken, because she would have no further talka, she filled their laps with gold and silver, and bid Zephyrus to bear them away. In their return homeward they murmured within themselves, saying, How say you sister to so apparent a lie of Psyche's? First she said that her husband was a young man of flourishing years, and had a flaxen beard, and now she saith that he is half grey with age. What is he that in so short a space can become so old? You shall find it no otherwise, my sister, but that either this cursed queen hath invented a great lie, or else that she never saw the shape of her husband. And if it be so that she never saw him, then verily she is married to some god, and hath a young god in her belly. But if it be a divine babe, and fortune to come to the ears of my mother, as God forbid it should, then may I go and hang myself, wherefore let us go to our parents, and with forged lies let us color the matter. After they were thus inflamed, and had visited their parents, they returned again to the mountain, and by the aid of the wind Zephyrus were carried down into the valley, and after they had strained their eyelids, to enforce themselves to weep, they called unto Psyches in this sort, Thou, ignorant of so great evil, thinkest thyself sure and happy, and sittest at home nothing regarding thy peril, whereas we go about thy affairs and are careful lest any harm should happen unto you. For we are credibly informed, neither can we but utter it unto you, that there is a great serpent full of deadly poison, with a ravenous gaping throat, that leath with thee every night. Remember the oracle of Apollo, who pronounced that thou shouldest be married to a dire and fierce serpent, and many of the inhabitants hereby, and such as hunt about in the Count Ray, affirm that they saw him yesternight returning from pasture and swimming over the river, whereby they do undoubtedly say, that he will not pamper thee long with delicate meats, but when the time of delivery shall approach he will devour both thee and thy child, wherefore advise thyself whether thou wilt agree unto us that are careful of thy safety, and so avoid the peril of death, be contented to live with thy sisters, or whether thou remain with the serpent and in the end be swallowed into the gulf of his body. And if it be so that thy solitary life, thy conversation with voices, the servile and dangerous pleasure, and the love of the serpent do more delight thee, say not but that we have played the parts of natural sisters in warning thee. Then the poor and simple miser Psyches was moped with the fear of so dreadful words, and being amazed in her mind, did clean forget the admonitions of her husband, and her own promises made unto him, and throwing herself headlong into extreme misery, with a wan and sallow countenance, scantily uttering a third word, at length gone say in this sort, O oh my most dear sisters, I heartily thank you for your great kindness toward me, and I am now verily persuaded that they which have informed you hereof hath informed you of nothing but truth, for I never saw the shape of my husband, neither know I from whence he came, only I hear his voice in the night, insomuch that I have an uncertain husband, and one that loveth not the light of the day, which causeth me to suspect that he is a beast, as you affirm. Moreover, I do greatly fear to see him, for he doth menace and threaten great evil unto me, if I should go about to spy and behold his shape wherefore my loving sisters if you have any holy own remedy for your sister in danger, give it now presently. Then they opened the gates of their subtil Mindies, and did put away all privy guile, and egged her forward in her fearful thoughts, persuading her to do as they would have her whereupon one of them began and said, Because that we little esteem any peril or danger, to save your life we intend to shew you the best way and mean as we may possibly do. Take a sharp razor and put it under the pillow of your bed, and see that you have ready a privy burning lampy with oil, hid under some part of the hanging of the chamber and finally dissembling the matter when according to his custom he cometh to bed and sleepeth soundly, arise you secretly, and with your bare feet go and take the lampy, with the razor in your right hand and with valiant force cut off the head of the poisonous serpent, wherein we will aid and assist you, and when by the death of him you shall be made safe, we will marry you to some comely man. After they had thus inflamed the heart of their sister fearing lest some danger might happen unto them by reason of their evil counsel, they were carried by the wind Zephyrus to the top of the mountain, and so they ran away and took shipping.
When Psyches was left alone, saving that she seemed not to be alone, being stirred by so many furies, she was in a tossing men like the waves of the sea, and although her will was obstinate, and resisted to put in execution the counsel of her sisters, yet she was in doubtful and divers opinions touching her calamity. Sometimes she would, sometimes she would not, sometimes she is bold, sometimes she feareth, sometimes she mistrusteth, sometimes she is moved, sometimes she hateth the beast, sometimes she loveth her husband, but at length night came, when is she prepared for her wicked intent? Soon after her husband came, and when he had kissed and embraced her he fell asleep. Then Psyches, somewhat feeble in body and mind, yet moked by cruelty of fate, received boldness and brought forth the lampy, and took the razor, so by her audacity she changed her mind, but when she took the lamp and came to the bedside, she saw the most meek and sweetest beast of all beasts, even fair Cupid couched fairly, at whose sight the very lampy increased his light for joy, and the razor turned his edge. But when Psyche saw so glorious a body she greatly feared, and amazed in mind, with a pale countenance all trembling fell on her knees and thought to hide the razor, yet verily in her own heart, which doubtless she had done, had it not through fear of so great an enterprise fallen out of her hand. And when she saw and beheld the beauty of the divine visage she was well recreated in her mind, she saw his hairs of gold, that yielded out a sweet savour, his neck more white than milk, his purple cheeks, his hair hanging comely behind and before, the brightness whereof did darken the light of the lamp, his tender plume feathers, dispersed upon his shoulders like shining flowers, and trembling hither and thither, and his other parts of his body so smooth and so soft, that it did not repent. Venus to bear such a child. At the bed's feet lay his bow, quiver, and arrows, that be the weapons of so great a god, which when Psyches did curiously behold, she marveling at her husband's weapons, took one of the arrows out of the quiver, and pricked herself withal, wherewith she was so grievously wounded that the blood followed, and thereby of her own accord she added love upon love. Then more broiling in the love of Cupid she embraced him and kissed him and kissed him a thousand times, fearing the measure of his sleep. But alas while she was in this great joy, whether it were for envy for desire to touch this amiable body likewise, there fell out a drop of burning oil from the lampy upon the right shoulder of the god. O rash and bold lampy, the vile ministry of love, how darest thou be so bold as to burn the god of all fire? When is he invented thee, to the intent that all lovers might with more joy passe the nights in pleasure? The god being burned in this sort, and perceiving that promise and faith was broken, he fled away without utterance of any word, from the eyes and hands of his most unhappy wife. But Psyche's fortune to catch him as he was rising by the right thigh, and held him fast as he flew above in the air, until such time as constrained by weariness she let go and fell down upon the ground. But Cupid followed her down, and lighted upon the top of a cypress tree, and angrily spake unto her in this manner, O simple Psyches, consider with thyself how I, little regarding the commandment of my mother, who willed me that thou shouldst be married to a man of base and miserable condition, did come myself from heaven to love thee, and wounded mine own body with my proper weapons, to have thee to my spouse, and did I see me a beast unto thee, that thou shouldst go about to cut off my head with a razor, who loved thee so well. Did not I always give thee a charge? Did not I gently will thee to beware? But those cursed aids and counsellors of thine shall be worthily rewarded for their pains. As for thee thou shalt be sufficiently punished by my absence. When he had spoken these words he took his flight into the air. Then Psyches fell flat on the ground, and as long as she could see her husband she cast her eyes after him into the air, weeping and lamenting piteously, but when he was gone out of her sight she threw herself into the next running river, for the great anguish and dolor that she was in for the lack of her husband, howbeit the water would not suffer her to be drowned, but took pity upon her, in the honor of Cupid which accustomed to broil and burn the river, and threw her upon the bank amongst the herbs. Then Pan the rustical god sitting on the riverside, embracing and, instructing, the goddess Canna to tune her songs and pipes, by whom were feeding the young and tender goats, after that he perceived Psyche's in sorrowful case, not ignorant, I know not by what means, of her miserable estate, endeavoured to pacific her in this sort, O fair maid, I am a rustic and rude herdsman, howbeit by reason of my old age expert in many things, for as far as I can learn by conjecture, which, according as wise men do term is called divination, I perceive by your uncertain gait, your pale H-E-W, your sobbing sighs, 
and your watery eyes, that you are greatly in love. Wherefore hearken to me, and go not about to slay yourself, nor weep not at all, but rather adore and worship the great god Cupid, and win him unto you by your gentle promise of service. When the god of shepherds had spoken these words, she gave no answer, but made reverence to him as to a god, and so departed. After that Psyches had gone a little way, she fortuned unawares to come to a city where the husband of one of her sisters did dwell. Which when Psyches did understand, she caused that her sister had knowledge of her coming, and so they met together, and after great embracing and salutation, the sister of Psyches demanded the cause of her travel thither. Mary, quoth she, do you not remember the counsel you gave me, whereby you would that I should kill the beast which under color of my husband did lie with me every night? You shall understand, that as soon as I brought forth the lampy to see and behold his shape, I perceived that he was the son of Venus, even Cupid himself that lay with me. Then I being stricken with great pleasure, and desirous to embrace him, could not thoroughly assuage my delight, but alas by evil ill chance the oil of the lampy fortune to fall on his shoulder which caused him to awake, and seeing me armed with fire and weapons, gone say, how darest thou be so bold to do so great a mischief? Depart from me and take such things as thou didst bring, for I will have thy sister, and named you, to my wife, and she shall be placed in thy felicity, and by and by he commanded Zephyrus to carry me away from the bounds of his house. Psyches had scantly finished her tale but her sister pierced with the prick of carnal desire and wicked envy ran home, and feigning to her husband that she had heard word of the death of her parents took shipping and came to the mountain. And although there blew a contrary wind, yet being brought in a vain hope she cried, O Cupid, take me a more worthy wife, and thou Zephyrus bear down thy mistress, and so she cast herself headlong from the mountain, but she fell not into the valley neither alive nor dead, for all the members and parts of her body were torn amongst the rocks, where be she was made prey unto the birds and wild beasts, as she worthily deserved. Neither was the vengeance of the other delayed, for Psyche's travelling in that country, fortune to come to another city where her other sister did dwell, to whom when she had declared all such things as she told to her other sister she ran likewise unto the rock and was slain in lake sort. Then Psyche's travelled about in the Count Ray to seek her husband Cupid, but he was gotten into his mother's chamber and there bewailed the sorrowful wound which he caught by the oil of a burning lamp. Then the white bird the gull, which swims on the waves of the water, flew toward the ocean sea, where he found Venus washing and bathing herself, to whom she declared that her son was burned and in danger of death, and moreover that it was a common brute in the mouth of every person, who spake evil of all the family of Venus, that her son doth nothing but haunt harlots in the mountain, and she herself lasciviously used to riot in the sea, where be they say that they are now become no more. Gracious, pleasant nor gentle, but in civile, monstrous and horrible. Moreover, that marriages are not for any amity, or for love of procreation, but full of envy, discord, and debate. This the curious ghoul did clatter in the ears of Venus, reprehending her son. But Venus began to cry and said, What hath my son gotten any love? I pray thee gentle bird that doest serve me so faithfully, tell me what she is, and what is her name that hath troubled my son in such sort? Whether she be any of the nymphs, of the number of the goddesses, of the company of the muses, or of the mystery of the graces? To whom the bird answered, Madam, I know not what she is, but this I know that she is called Psyches. Then Venus with indignation cried out, What is it she? The usurper of my beauty, the vicar of my name? What did he think that I was a bod, by whose shoe he fell acquainted with the maid? And immediately she departed and went to her chamber where she found her son wounded as it was told unto her, whom when she beheld she cries out in this sort. Is this an honest thing? Is this honorable to thy parents? Is this reason, that thou hast violated and broken the commandment of thy mother and sovereign mistress, and whereas thou shouldst have vexed my enemy with loathsome love, thou hast done otherwise? For being of tender and unripe years, thou hast with too licentious appetite embraced my most mortal foe, to whom I shall be made a mother, and she a daughter. Thou presumest and thinkest, thou trifling boy, thou varlet, and without all reverence, that thou art most worthy and excellent, and that I am not able by reason of mine age to have another son, which if I should have, thou shouldst well understand that I would be a more worthier than thou. 
But to work thee a greater despite, I do determine to adopt one of my servants, and to give him these wings, this fire, this bow, and these arrows, and all other furniture which I gave to thee, not to this purpose, neither is anything given thee of thy father for this intent, but first thou hast been evil brought up and instructed in thy youth thou hast thy hands ready and sharp. Thou hast often offended thy ancients, and especially me that am thy mother, thou hast pierced me with thy darts thou contemnest me as a widow, neither dost thou regard thy valiant and invincible father, and to anger me more, thou art amorous of harlots and wenches, hot I will cause that thou shalt shortly repent thee, and that this marriage shall be dearly bought. To what a point am I now driven? What shall I do? Whither shall I go? How shall I repress this beast? Shall I ask aid of mine enemy sobriety, whom I have often offended to engender thee? Or shall I seek for counsel of every poor rustic old woman? No, no, yet had I rather die, howbeit I will not cease my vengeance, to her must I have recourse for help, and to none other, I mean to sobriety, who may correct thee sharply, take away thy quiver, deprive thee of thy arrows, unbend thy bow, quench thy fire, and which is more subdue thy body with punishment, and when that I have raised and cut off this thy hair, which I have dressed with mine own hands, and made to glitter like gold, and when I have clipped thy wings, which I myself have caused to Bergen, then shall I think to have revenged myself sufficiently upon thee for the injury which thou hast done. When she had spoken these words she departed in a great rage out of her chamber. Immediately as she was going away came Juno and Ceres, demanding the cause of her anger. Then Venus answered, Verily you are come to comfort my sorrow, but I pray you with all diligence to seek out one whose name is Psyches, who is a vagabond, and runneth about the countries, and, as I think, you are not ignorant of the brute of my son Cupid, and of his demeanor, which I am ashamed to declare. Then they understanding the whole matter, endeavored to mitigate the ire of Venus in this sort, What is the cause, madam, or how hath your son so offended, that you should so greatly accuse his love, and blame him by reason that he is amorous? And why should you seek the death of her, whom he doth fancy? We most humbly entreat you to pardon his fault if he have accorded to the mind of any maiden. What do you not know that he is a young man? Or have you forgotten of what years he is? Doth he see me always unto you to be a child? You are his mother, and a kind woman, will you continually search out his dalliance? Will you blame his luxury? Will you bridle his love? And will you reprehend your own art and delights in him? What god or man is he, that can endure that you should sow or disperse your seed of love in every place? and to make restraint thereof within your own doors? Certes you will be the cause of the suppression of the public paces of young dames. In this sort this goddess endeavored to pacify her mind, and to excuse Cupid with all their power, although he were absent, for fear of his darts and shafts of love. But Venus would in no wise assuage her heat, but, thinking that they did rather trifle and taunt at her injuries, she departed from them, and took her voyage towards the sea in all haste. In the mean season Psyches hurled herself hither and thither, to seek her husband, the rather because she thought that if he would not be appeased with the sweet flattery of his wife, yet he would take mercy on her at her servile and continual prayers. And, as being at church on the top of a high hill, she said, What can I tell whether my husband and master be there or no? Wherefore she went thitherward, and with great pain and travel, moved by hope, after that she climbed to the top of the mountain, she came to the temple, and went in, whereas behold she espied chefs of corn lying on a heap, blades withered with garlands, and reeds of barley, moreover she saw hooks, sids, sickles, and other instruments, to reap, but everything lay out of order, and as it were cast in by the hands of laborers which when Psyche saw she gathered up and put everything in. Order, thinking that she would not despise or contemn the temples of any of the gods, but rather get the favor and benevolence of them all. By and by Ceres came in, and beholding her bussy and curious in her chapel, cried out afar off, and said, O Psyche's needful of mercy, Venus searcheth for thee in every place to revenge herself and to punish thee grievously, but thou hast more mind to be here, and carest for nothing less, than for thy safety. Then Psyche's fell on her knees before her, watering her feet with her tears, wiping the ground with her hair, and with great weeping and lamentation desired pardon, saying, O great and holy goddess, I pray thee by thy plenteous and liberal right hand, by the joyful ceremonies of thy harvest, by the secrets of thy sacrifice, by the flying chariots of thy dragons, by the tillage of the ground of Sicily, which thou hast invented, by the marriage of Proserpine, 
by the diligent inquisition of thy daughter, and by the other secrets which are within the temple of Eleusis in the land of Athens, take pity on me thy servant Psyches, and let me hide myself a few days amongst these chefs of corn, until the ire of so great a goddess be passed, or until that I be refreshed of my great labor and travel. Then answered Ceres, Dearly Psyches, I am greatly moved by thy prayers and tears, and desire with all my heart to aid thee, but if I should suffer thee to be hidden here, I should increase the displeasure of my cousin, with whom I have made a traitor of peace, and an ancient promise of amity, wherefore I advise thee to depart hence and take it not an evil part in that I will not suffer thee to abide and remain here within my temple. Then Psyches driven away contrary to her hope, was double afflicted with sorrow and so she returned back again. And behold she perceived afar off in a valley a temple standing within a forest, fair and curiously wrought, and minding to overpass a no place whither better hope did direct her, and to the intent she would desire pardon of every god, she approached nigh unto the sacred door, whereas she saw precious riches and vestments engraven with letters of gold, hanging upon branches of trees, and the posts of the temple testifying the name of the goddess Juno, to whom they were dedicate, then she kneeled down upon her knees, and embraced the altar with her hands, and wiping her tears, gone pray in this sort, O dear spouse and sister of the great god Jupiter which art adored and worshipped amongst the great temples of Samos, called upon by women with child, worshipped at high Carthage, because thou wast brought from heaven by the lion, the rivers of the flood and Achis do celebrate thee, and know that thou art the wife of the great god, and the goddess of goddesses, all the east part of. The world have thee in veneration, all the world calleth thee Lucina, I pray thee to be my advocate in my tribulations, deliver me from the great danger which pursueth me, and save me that am weary with so long labours and sorrow, for I know that it is thou that succorest and helpest such women as are with child and in danger. Then Juno hearing the prayers of Psyches, appeared unto her in all her royalty, saying, Certes Psyches I would gladly help thee, but I am ashamed to do anything contrary to the will of my daughter-in-law Venus, whom always I have loved as mine own child, moreover I shall incur the danger of the law, intituled, De Servo Corrupto, whereby am forbidden to retain any servant fugitive, against the will of his master. Then Psyches cast off likewise by Juno, as without all hope of the recovery of her husband, reasoned with herself in this sort, Now what comfort or remedy is left to my afflictions, when as my prayers will nothing avail with the goddesses? What shall I do? Whither shall I go? In what cave or darkness shall I hide myself, to avoid the furor of Venus? Why do I not take a good heart, and offer myself with humility unto her, whose anger I have wrought? What do I know whether he, whom I seek for, be in his mother's house or no? Thus being in doubt, poor Psyches prepared herself to her own danger, and devised how she might make her orison in prayer unto Venus. After that Venus was weary with searching by sea and land for Psyches, she returned toward heaven, and commanded that one should prepare her chariot which her husband Vulcanus gave unto her by reason of marriage, so finely wrought that neither gold nor silver could be compared to the brightness thereof. For white pigeons guided the chariot with great diligence, and when Venus was entrayed in a number of sparrows flew chirping about, making signet of joy, and all other kind of birds sang sweetly, for shewing the coming of the great goddess, the clouds gave place, the heavens opened, and received her joyfully, the birds that followed nothing feared the eagle, hawks, or other ravenous foals of the air. Incontinently she went unto the royal palace of god Jupiter, and with a proud and bold petition demanded the service of Mercury, in certain of her affairs, whereunto Jupiter consented, then with much joy she descended from heaven with Mercury, and gave him an earnest charge to put in execution her words, saying, O my brother, born in Arcadia, thou knowest well, that I, who am thy sister, did never enterprise to do anything without thy presence, thou knowest also how long I have sought. For a girl and cannot find her, Wherefore there resteth nothing else save that thou with thy trumpet do pronounce the reward to such as take her, see thou put in execution my commandment, and declare that whatsoever he be that retaineth her wittingly, against my will shall not defend himself by any mean or excusation, which when she had spoken, she delivered unto him a libel, wherein was contained the name of Psyches, and the residue of his publication, which done, she departed away to. Her Lodging By and by, Mercurius, not delaying the matter, proclaimed throughout all the world, that whatsoever he were that could tell any tidings of a king's fugitive daughter, the servant of Venus, named Psyches, should bring word to Mercury, and for reward of his pains, he should receive seven sweet kisses of Venus. After that Mercury had pronounced these things, 
Every man was inflamed with desire to search out psyches. This proclamation was the cause that put all doubt from Psyches, who was scantily come in the sight of the house of Venus, but one of her servants called Castone came out, who as being Psyches, cried with a loud voice, saying, O wicked harlot as thou art, now at length thou shalt know that thou hast a mistress above thee. What, dost thou make thyself ignorant, as though thou didst not understand what travel we have taken in searching for thee? I am glad that thou art come into my hands, thou art now in the gulfy of hell and shalt abide the pain and punishment of thy great contumacy, and therewithal she took her by the hair, and brought her in, before the presence of the goddess Venus. When Venus spied her, she began to laugh, and as angry persons accustomed to do, she shaked her head, and scratched her right ear saying, O goddess, goddess, you are now come at length to visit your husband that is in danger of death, by your means, be you assured, I will handle you like a daughter, where be my maidens, sorrow, and sadness? To whom, when they came, she delivered Psyches to be cruelly tormented, then they fulfilled the commandment of their mistress, and after they had piteously scourged her with rods and whips, they presented her again before Venus, then she began to laugh again, saying, Behold she thinks, that by reason of her great belly, which she hath gotten by playing the whore, to move me to pity, and to make me a grandmother to her child. Am not I happy, that in the flourishing time of all mine age, shall be called a grandmother, and the son of a vile harlot shall be accounted the nephew of Venus, howbeit I am a fool to term him by the name of my son, since as the marriage was made between unequal persons, in the field without witnesses, and not by the consent of parents, wherefore the marriage is illegitimate, and the child, that shall be born, a bastard, if we fortune to suffer thee to live so long till thou be delivered. When Venus had spoken these words she leaped upon the face of poor Psyches, and, tearing her apparel, took her by the hair, and dashed her head upon the ground. Then she took a great quantity of wheat, of barley, poppy seed, pisin, lentless, and beans, and mingled them all together on a heap, saying, Thou evil favored girl, thou seemest unable to get the grace of thy lover, by no other means, but only by diligent and painful service, wherefore I will prove what thou canst do, see that thou separate all these grains one from another disposing them orderly in their quantity, and let it be done before night. When she had appointed this task unto Psyches, she departed to a great banquet that was prepared that day. But Psyches when not about to dissever the grain, as being a thing impossible to be brought to passe by reason it lay so confusedly scattered, but being asked to eat at the cruel commandment of Venus, sate still and said nothing. Then the little Pismire the emote, taking pity of her great difficulty in labor, cursing the cruelness of the daughter of Jupiter, and of so evil a mother, ran about, hither and thither, and called to all her friends, Ye quick sons of the ground, the mother of all things, take mercy on this poor maid, espoused to Cupid, who is in great danger of her person, I pray you help her with all diligence. Incontinently one came after another, dissevering and dividing the grain, and after that they had put each kind of corn in order, they ran away again in all haste. When night came, Venus returned home from the banquet W.E.L. tippled with wine, smelling of balm, and crowned with garlands of roses, who when she had espied what Psyches had done, gone say, This is not the labor of thy hands, but rather of his that is amorous of thee, then she gave her a morsel of brown bread, and went to sleep. In the mean season, Cupid was closed fast in the surest chamber of the house, partly because he should not hurt himself with wanton dalliance, and partly because he should not speak with his love so these two lovers were divided one from another. When night was past Venus called Psyches, and said, Sayest thou yonder forest that extendeth out in length with the river? There be great sheep shining like gold, and kept by no manner of person. I command thee that thou go thither and bring me home some of the wool of their fleeces. Psyches arose willingly not to do her commandment, but to throw herself headlong into water to end her sorrows. Then a green reed inspired by divine inspiration, with a gracious tune and melody gone say, O Psyches I pray thee not to trouble or pollute my water by the death of thee, and yet beware that thou go not towards the terrible sheep of this coast, until such time as the heat of the sun be past, for when the sun is in his force, then see me they most dreadful and furious, with their sharp horns, their stony foreheads and their gaping throats, wherewith they arm themselves to the destruction of mankind. But until they have refreshed themselves in the river, thou must hide thyself here by me, under this great plane tree, and as soon as their great fury is past, thou mayst go among the thickets and bushes under the woodside and gather the locks their golden fleeces, which thou shalt find hanging upon the briars. 
Then spake the gentle and benign reed, shewing Amin to Psyches to save her life, which she bore well in memory, and with all diligence went and gathered up such locks as she found, and put them in her apron, and carried them home to Venus. Howbeit the danger of this second labor did not please her, nor give her sufficient witness of the good service of Psyches, but with a sower resemblance of laughter, did say, Of a certain I know that this is not thy fact, but I will prove if that thou be of so stout, so good a courage, and singular prudency as thou seemest to be. Then Venus spake unto Psyches again saying, Sayest thou the top of yonder great hill, from whence there runneth down waters of black and deadly color, which nourisheth the floods of Styx, Cositus? I charge thee to go thither, and bring me a vessel of that water, wherewithal she gave her a bottle of Christ all, menacing and threatening her rigorously. Then poor Psyches went in all haste to the top of the mountain, rather to end her life, than to fetch any water, and when she was come up to the ridge of the hill, she perceived that it was impossible to bring it to Passe, for she saw a great rock gushing out most horrible fountains of waters, which ran down and fell by many stops and passages into the valley beneath, on each side she did see great dragons, which were stretching out their long and bloody necks, that did never sleep, but appointed to keep the river there, the waters seemed to themselves likewise saying, Away, away, what wilt thou do? Fly, fly, or else thou wilt be slain. Then Psyches, seeing the impossibility of this affair, stood still as though she were transformed into a stone and although she was present in body, yet was she absent in spirit and sense, by reason of the great peril which she saw, insomuch that she could not comfort herself with weeping, such was the present danger that she was in. But the royal bird of great Jupiter, the eagle remembering his old service which he had done, when as by the prick of Cupid he brought up the boy Ganymedes to the heavens, to be made butler of Jupiter, and minding to shew the like service in the person of the wife of Cupid, came from the high house of the skies, and said unto Psyches, O simple woman without all experience, doest thou think to get or dip up any drop of this dreadful water? No, no, assure thyself thou art never able to come nigh it, for the gods themselves do greatly fear at the sight thereof. What, have you not heard, that it is a custom among men to swear by the puissance of the gods, and the gods do swear by the majesty of the river sticks? But give me thy bottle, and so daintily he took it, and filled it with the water of the river, and taking his flight through those cruel and horrible dragons, brought it unto Psyches, who being very joyful thereof, presented it to Venus, who would not yet be appeased, but menacing more and more said, What, thou seemest unto me a very witch and enchantress, that bringest these things to passe, howbeit thou shalt do nothing more. Take this box into hell to Proserpina, and desire her to send me a little of her beauty, as much as will serve me the space of one day, and say that such as I had is consumed away since my son fell sick, but return again quickly, for I must dress myself there withal, and go to the theater of the gods, then poor Psyches perceived the end of all fortune, thinking verily that she should never return, and not without cause, when as she was compelled to go to the gulf and furies of hell. Wherefore without any further delay, she went up to an high tower to throw herself down headlong, thinking that it was the next and readiest way to hell, but the tower, as inspired, spake unto her saying, O poor miser, why goest thou about to slay thyself? Why dost thou rashly yield unto thy last peril and danger? Know thou that if thy spirit be once separated from thy body, thou shalt surely go to hell, but never to return again, wherefore hearken to me, lest demon a city in Greece is not far a hence, go thou thither and inquire for the hill Teneris, whereas thou shalt find a hold leading to hell, even to the palace of Pluto, but take heed thou go not with empty hands to that place of darkness, but carry two sops sodden in the flour of barley and honey in thy hands, and two half a pence in thy mouth. And when thou hast passed a good part of that way, thou shalt see a lame assy carrying of wood, and a lame fellow driving him, who will desire thee to give him up the sticks that fall down, but passe thou on and do nothing, by and by thou shalt come unto a river of hell, where is Sharon his ferryman, who will first have his fair pied him, before he will carry the souls over the river in his boat, whereby you may see that avarice reigneth amongst the dead, neither Sharon nor Pluto will do any. Think for naught, for if it be a poor man that would passe over and lacketh money, he shall be compelled to die in his journey before they will shew him any relief, wherefore deliver to Karain Sharon one of the halfpence, which thou bearest for thy passage, and let him receive it out of thy mouth. And it shall come to passe as thou sittest in the boat thou shalt see an old man swimming on the top of the river, holding up his deadly hands, and desiring thee to receive him into the bark, 
but have no regard to his piteous cry, when thou art passed over the flood, thou shalt thus be old women spinning, who will desire thee to help them, but beware thou do not consent unto them in any case, for these in like baits and traps will Venus set to make thee let fall one of thy sops, and think not. That the keeping of thy sops is a like matter, for if thou lease one of them thou shalt be assured never to return again to this world. Then shalt thou see a great and marvellous dog, with three heads, barking continually at the souls of such as enter in, but he can do them no other harm, he leeth day and night before the gate of Proserpina, and keepeth the house of Pluto with great diligence, to whom if thou cast one of thy sops, thou mayst have access to Proserpina without all danger, she will make thee good cheer, and entertain thee with delicate meat and drink, but sit thou upon the ground, and desire brown bread. And then declare thy message unto her, and when thou hast received such beauty as she giveth, in thy return appease the rage of the dog with thy other sop, and give thy other half penny to covetous Sharon, and come the same way again into the world as thou wentest, but above all things have a regard that thou look not in the box, neither be not too curious about the treasure of the divine beauty. In this manner the tower spake unto Psyches, and advertised her what she should do, and immediately she took two half pence, two sops, and all things necessary, and went to the mountain Teneris to go towards hell. After that Psyches had passed by the lame assy, paid her half penny for passage, neglected the old man in the river, denied to help the woman spinning, and filled the ravenous month of the dog with a sop, she came to the chamber of Proserpina. There Psyches would not sit in any royal seat, nor eat any delicate meats, but kneeled at the feet of Proserpina, only contented with coarse bread, declared her message, and after she had received a mystical secret in a box, she departed, and stopped the mouth of the dog with the other sop, and pied the boatman the other halfpenny. When Psyches was returned from hell, to the light of the world, she was ravished with great desire, saying, Am not I a fool, that knowing that I carry here the divine beauty, will not take a little thereof to garnish my face, to please my love withal? And by and by she opened the box where she could perceive no beauty nor anything else, save only an infernal and deadly sleep, which immediately invaded all her members as soon as the box was uncovered, in such sort that she fell down upon the ground, and lay there as a sleeping core. But Cupid being now healed of his wound and malady, not able to endure the absence of Psyches, got him secretly out at a window of the chamber where he was enclosed, and, receiving his wings, took his flight towards his loving wife, whom when he had found, he wiped away the sleep from her face, and put it again into the box, and awaked her with the tip of one of his arrows, saying, Wretched caitiff, behold thou wert well nigh perished again, with the overmuch curiosity, well, go. Thou, and do thy message to my mother, and in the mean season, I will provide for all things accordingly, wherewithal he took his flight into the air, and Psyches brought her present to Venus. Cupid being more and more in love with Psyches, and fearing the displeasure of his mother, did pierce into the heavens, and arrived before Jupiter to declare his cause, then Jupiter after that he had Ephson embraced him, gone say in this manner, O my well-beloved son, although thou hast not given due reverence and honour unto me as thou oughtest to do, but haste rather spoiled and wounded this my breast, whereby the laws and order of the elements and planets be disposed, with continual assaults, of Terran luxury and against all laws, and the discipline Julia, and the utility of the public wheel, in transforming my divine beauty into serpents, fire, savage beasts, birds, and into bulls, howbeit remembering my modesty, and that I have nourished thee with mine own proper hands, I will do and accomplish all thy desire so that thou canst beware of spiteful and envious persons. And if there be any excellent maiden of comely beauty in the world, remember yet the benefit which I shall shew unto thee by recompense of her love towards me again. When he had spoken these words he commanded Mercury to call all the gods to counsel, and if any of the celestial powers did fail of appearance he would be condemned in ten thousand pounds, which sentence was such a terror to all the goddesses, that the high theatre was replenished, and Jupiter began to speak in this sort, O ye gods, registered in the books of the muses, you all know this young man Cupid whom I have nourished with mine own hands, whose raging flames of his first youth, I fought best to bridle and restrain. It sufficeth that he is defamed in every place for his adulterous living, wherefore all occasion ought to be taken away by mean of marriage, he hath chosen a maiden that fancieth him well, and hath bereaved her of her virginity, let him have her still and possess her according to his own pleasure, then he returned to Venus, and said, And you my daughter, take you no care, neither fear the dishonor of your progeny and estate, neither have regard in that it is a mortal marriage, for it. 
seemeth unto me just, lawful, and legitimate by the law civil. Incontinently after Jupiter commanded Mercury to bring out Psyches, the spouse of Cupid, into the palace of heaven. And then he took a pot of immortality, and said, Hold Psyches, and drink, to the end thou mayst be immortal, and that Cupid may be thine everlasting husband. By and by the great banquet and marriage feast was sumptuously prepared, Cupid sate down with his dear spouse between his arms, Juno likewise with Jupiter, and all the other gods in order, Ganymedes filled the pot of Jupiter, and Bacchus served the rest. Their drink was nectar the wine of the gods, Volcanus prepared supper, the Howers decked up the house with roses and other sweet smells, the graces threw about blame, the muses sang with sweet harmony, Apollo tuned pleasantly to the harp, Venus danced finely, Satyrus and Paniscus plaid on their pipes, and thus Psyches was married to Cupid, and after she was delivered of a child whom we call pleasure. This the trifling old woman declared unto the captive maiden, but I poor assy, not standing for a ray of, was not a little sorry in that I lacked pen and ink to write so worthy a tale.